This audiobook is for educational purposes and is for personal use only. God Never Fails by Mary Cupfill. The late Florence Cavill Shin was widely known for many years as an artist and illustrator, metaphysician and lecturer, and as having helped thousands of people by her great work of healing and assisting in solving their problems. This audiobook consists of a series of addresses given by Mrs. Shin, teaching the individual to control conditions and release abundance through a knowledge of spiritual law. 1. The grace of God is upon you. Whatever your appointed tasks may be this day, go forth rejoicing, knowing that the grace of God is upon you. Before you set your hand to any task, before you take any action, use a few moments to remind yourself of this truth and affirm quietly, in faith, I go forward joyously, for the grace of God is upon me. You will find your accomplishment of your tasks easier than you had thought possible, your efforts abundantly fruitful and rewarding. In telling us of the boy Jesus, Luke says, the child grew, and waxed strong, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. This same grace, dear friend, is not reserved for Jesus only, but is given freely to every growing, unfolding child of God throughout eternity. The watchful Father is as eager to pour out his love upon you and me as upon Jesus Christ, for he knows and sees us, each one as a son of his own creation, image of his own being, worthy of his tenderest benediction. Because we are all sons of God, we are free to recognize and accept the grace, the love, of God in the same full measure just as Jesus did. Because you are a son of God, you are meant to assume the same attitude, manner, and bearing that you feel Jesus Christ himself assumed in his earthly ministry. You are meant to act in the same manner as he and you can, because the grace of God is upon you. You are meant to conduct yourself with the same dignity, having the same spiritual assurance you know he had, and you can, because the grace of God is upon you. If something extremely difficult seems to be required of you, if you are faced with a trying situation, condition, or circumstance, set aside all doubts and fears right now, and for a few moments simply acknowledge your own divine sonship declare in faith, God loves me. His grace is upon me, and only good can come. Let the words, His grace is upon me, move through your thoughts, speak them aloud, then relax and accept them throughout your whole being. God's grace is upon you, upon your mind and its activity, upon your body and its functions, upon your life and affairs. God's grace is upon you now, blessing you, encouraging you, helping you uplifting you, sustaining you, protecting you, guiding and directing you. Wherever your duties take you, the grace of God is upon you. Wherever your duties keep you, the grace of God is upon you. However distasteful, unappealing, routine, monotonous, unrewarding your work or assignment may seem, the grace of God is upon you, and his blessings pour through you. However demanding, However filled with responsibility your appointment, the grace of God is upon you, and you are filled with new wisdom and confidence. Because the grace of God is upon you, the dignity of Christ, the serenity of Christ, hold you poised, the love of Christ keeps you gracious and compassionate, the competence of Christ leads you into success and satisfaction. The grace of God is upon your hands as they serve, regardless of the capacity in which they serve. If your service seems menial and humble, the grace of God will transform that service into a ministry to the glory of God. If your service seems of great importance to the world, the grace of God will lend to that service a humility and beauty that glorifies not personality but spirit. Know that the grace of God is upon every thought you think, every word you speak, every step you take, is upon your every action, decision, and movement. As you realize this, your thoughts will be clear, illumined, your words will be convincing, faith-filled, your actions will be spiritually significant, blessed. Recognize, accept the wonderful truth that God loves you, that His grace is upon you as you grow and wax strong in spiritual expression. The grace of God is upon you this day, this hour, this moment.
it is upon your body temple, upon your business, upon your home, upon your entire life, and you are blessed, blessed, blessed. The grace of God is upon you now. 2. God never fails. The founder of the famous Bristol, England, orphanages, George Muller, lived by his faith that, whatever the need, God never fails. Over a period of some sixty years, he was able, through this faith, to build and maintain homes for more than two thousand orphans, able to raise nearly one and a half million pounds without asking anyone for a penny, able to be daily a living example of the goodness of God. At one time he remarked, not once, or five times, or five hundred times, but thousands of times in these three score years, have we had in hand not enough for one more meal, either in food or in funds, but not once has God failed us, not once have we or the orphans gone hungry or lacked any good thing. It is said that this faith-filled man never made auxiliary arrangements in case supplies did not arrive, he dug no second-line trenches. He had no outer friends to turn to, none on whom he could depend for assistance. All he did possess was a vital, living, active faith that he put to use day by day, hour by hour, minute by minute in everything he desired to accomplish. He simply believed that God was his one and only source of supply, unfailing and inexhaustible, and he tested and proved the truth of his belief. Whatever it is that you today are attempting to prove in your life, whether it concerns health, supply, or harmony, remember, God never fails. You need not depend on human judgments, upon personal opinions, upon outer circumstances and outworkings, but simply, only, upon God, the one source, the one giver, the one creator of all good. Cease to depend any longer upon appearances, upon human reasoning and logic, and depend wholly, absolutely, on God. Repeat to yourself over and over, both silently and aloud, God never fails. Take this thought into your heart this very moment, and repeat it again and again, God never fails. God never fails. God never fails. Keep repeating the words quietly but firmly and confidently, God never fails. God never fails. Say them with all the faith you can master. Repeat them with all the determination and conviction you can call upon from the very depths of your being. Hold to the truth they express, in spite of any outer conflict. Maintain your stand, regardless of any lashing of the winds and waves of the senses. Let this truth be the rock upon which you stand. Let it form the beginning, the foundation of a new and strong and indomitable faith, a faith that is your own divine birthright. You need not try to figure out how the situation can change and right itself. It is not up to you to look ahead to tomorrow or next week and to know in advance all the various details. You are not to be anxious and consider how, when, why, who your only part in the working out of your problem is to be still, take your stand, and know that God never fails. Steadfast in this state of mind, you are not anxious, no matter how many persons, things, or conditions on the outside seem to fail you, for in themselves these do not matter. All that does matter is God. And God is the same unchangeable, unvariable, loving Father now that He always has been. He is the same perfect presence and power today as when Jesus called upon Him two thousand years ago. He is the same dependable Creator and Sustainer, infinitely willing to bless, to heal, and to prosper every one of His children now and forever. A truth student who had been depending upon a certain source for a sum of money to handle an obligation was severely disappointed and discouraged when the source failed to produce as expected. In the very moment of discouragement, however, the student summoned all the faith at his command, declaring aloud, God never fails. Human channels may seem to fail, vary, or change, but God never does. God never changes. God never fails. Throughout the remainder of the day, this student maintained this attitude and clung to the truth, God never fails. Again and again he repeated the words, affirmed them, believed them. Within less than twenty-four hours, the needed amount was forthcoming from an unexpected, entirely different source. No matter what faces you, God never fails. 
He will not fail you in your dilemma. He will not fail you in your challenge. The only demand he makes upon you is that you have implicit trust in him. You are to turn wholly and completely to him and him only. You are not to give one smattering of attention elsewhere. Not one jot or tittle of your devotion is to be turned to outer things. All your heart, all your mind must be centered in just one place, God. If you will follow through with this extremely simple method of prayer and hold to it unwaveringly, you will prove for yourself that God does not fail. You will find that your faith is strengthened in the process, that your good becomes manifest in greater benefits than you even dreamed. A consciousness of light, an awareness of spiritual illumination, is the first step in the healing of any personal difficulty, even as it was the first step in the process of creation, and God said, Let there be light, and there was light. It was after this, after the coming of the light, that the other steps of creation followed all in the divine order that is typical of God and his nature of perfection. The true spiritual light, our first step in understanding and overcoming, is worth awaiting in our silent periods of prayer, worth our time and patience and application of faith, even as the dawn is worthy of all nature's quiet attention. The awakening of our souls anew to eternal spiritual truths and values cannot come any other way. Sometimes this awakening comes immediately, forcibly, within a prayer. Sometimes it comes gently, almost unnoticed, after we have prayed and then attended to the things at hand. Someone told recently of the way in which the light entered her consciousness during the healing of a loved one. She said that for a number of days she declared both silently and audibly the spiritual truths she knew regarding the dear one's divine inheritance of wholeness and perfection. She believed the person could be healed and was faithful in the application of all truth principles she knew. But it was finally upon her firm declaration, let there be light, that full realization came and the physical healing became apparent. The truth student mentioned that at this point of declaration something within her consciousness was awakened, that even as she stood at the ironing board the light so flooded her consciousness as to make all things new and clear. She explained that it was a realization that all that had gone before was past and was nothing. She had a firm conviction of healing that no human reasoning or intellectual argument could affect. Master. His answer to all their queries was, I know not, one thing I know, that, whereas I was blind, now I see. He saw light while he had been in darkness, and there was no human reasoning that could account for it. The answer is in the singleness of spiritual vision within Jesus. Where there is one with such purity of heart, devotedness of soul, one-pointedness of consciousness, the light is radiant to bless, heal, and uplift all who come within its presence and will receive. Such was the divinity within Jesus, the Christ light within him. And such it can be within you and me today if we will apply our attention, devote our efforts and become as little children teachable, obedient to inner guidance, watchful of our words and actions, ready to discipline and to master according to the Christ example. Day by day we prove this through the time we give to prayer and meditation. Day by day we prove this by our thoughts and words and actions. The more we pray, the oftener we turn our thoughts to God, and the more light becomes evident. The more we meditate about the meaning of Jesus' teachings the more enlightened our consciousness becomes. The higher we raise this light in our words and actions, the more Christ-like our words and actions become. The more steadfastly we look to the Father as the source of our wisdom and illumination the more open we become to receive his luminous blessings, the more aware we become of our spiritual identity, the more clearly we behold spiritual reality the Christ within everyone, God in everything. This light abides within you now, dear friend, as the illumination you desire for the overcoming of every difficult situation in your life. It is God's gift to you, awaiting your returning to him in consciousness, your awareness of his nearness and love. Lift up your heart to him in prayer now, in this moment, and decree, let there be light, and your eyes will be open to the reality of good, the reality of wholeness, wisdom, happiness and abundant well-being. 
the light will enter your consciousness, and you will see the truth within your heart, for that is the place of the overcoming. There lies the victory, there abides the light of the world. Meditation for self-help Let us face that problem confronting you right now. Let us look at it squarely and see it in its true light and take it for its true worth. No matter how long it has hampered your perfect expression of health or peace or success, let us now refuse to believe in failure or discouragement. Its appearance in your life is actually a shadow, temporarily darkening your thoughts and your day. It is only in your thoughts that you are bound and deceived by error and unhappiness. There is one sure way to cut those ties, child of God, and it is so simple and easy and perfect a way that we are apt to pass it by and look for a more arduous and difficult one. But it is in the simplicity of divine law that all things are made plain. Become as a little child, meek, and humble, willing to be guided by your father and maker. Free yourself from the tight, cramping style of vain struggle, and let, just let, his will be done in you. Relax and turn your face to the sunlight, as the shadows fall behind. As you still all noise and clamor and focus your attention on the magnificence and glory of the Father's word, on the blessed assurance of his ever-loving care and guiding hand, part of this heavenly blessing will seep into your heart and mind and body. When through your complete acceptance of divine law the clear, full light of truth and wisdom are permitted to shine forth, all shadows will dissolve. Then the shackles that bound you will lose their power and suddenly drop and fade into nothingness. Stand straight and strong and free, unfettered and unbound, acknowledge your divine and glorious heritage of health and plenty, peace and joy, the birthright that was yours from the beginning and now awaits your acceptance. Hear your father's promises, thou shalt also decree a thing, and it shall be established unto thee. All things whatsoever ye pray and ask for, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. Ask, and ye shall receive, that your joy may be made full. 3. Begin with God. Recently I had the opportunity to see a magnificent diamond called the Shah of Persia, said to be worth half a million dollars. About four inches in circumference and one inch in depth, it throbbed in its setting with liquid fire as though alive. The constantly changing, sparkling colors were unforgettably beautiful. Later that same day, looking over the rows of newly trimmed grapevines in the garden, I noticed the sap had begun to rise, and every pruned branch was starting to exude large globules of moisture. As the vine stirred, these globules caught the sunlight and flashed with a blinding brilliance surpassing even that of the famed, Shah of Persia. Diamonds out of the earth, into jewel, into vineyard, each beginning with the same source, God, the originator of all beauty, looking upon the grain of sand, we cannot tell how it cometh or whither it goeth, but we know that it is forever held in the bosom of the whole, the same as are the stars in the heavens and the gold in the earth. So it is that all goodness, all beauty, all truth starts with God, flows forth forever from the heart of God, whether it be in the form of a lovely jewel, a shining cluster of grapes, a towering pine, the phosphorescent beauty of the midnight ocean, a flaming sky, the melody of lark or mocking bird, whether it be abundance, joy, or radiant well-being for you and me, the highest endowed of all God's creations. Thus it is, beloved that to become aware of perfect health and strength we must begin where all health and strength begin, with God, the infinite source of eternal well-being. Thus it is, beloved, that to be conscious of radiant happiness and contentment we must begin with God, the author of divine fulfillment. Thus it is, beloved, that to know unfailing supply we must begin with God, the originator of everlasting abundance. It is only by beginning with God that we can behold the solution to all difficulties, only by starting with God that we can behold the truths about his kingdom and his children. It makes no difference what anyone appears to be or do, what it seems impossible for anyone to be or do, what changes are required in order to solve a problem, what transformation must be made in order to bring about light and understanding, peace and happiness. If we start with God it will be done.
Early one evening several years ago an incident occurred that reminded me of this truth. After returning home from a meeting with a group of young people I saw that one of the colored stones in a small pin was missing. Although an inexpensive piece of costume jewelry, the pin was a favorite one, and I had hesitated earlier that day to leave it on the coat lapel. On second thought however I had denied the suggestion of loss and gone on my way, walking five blocks to the bus stop, riding to school, meeting with the children in the schoolroom then conducting outdoor activities on the cinder playground. Reason and logic protested against the possibility of finding the small blue stone, but again I rejected the thought of loss and knew that if I, began with God, the stone would be found. Silently, humbly I asked the Father to show me how to proceed. Promptly following his inner guidance I returned to the school, walked across the grounds toward the school steps and at the first downward glance saw the stone directly before me. Every day we have many small opportunities like this, and others that are greater, where we can begin with God and behold His love becoming manifest in our life or in the lives of those about us. Let us awaken to the fact that we need not listen to personal reason and human logic but only begin with God to prove the reality of good. Let us awaken to the truth that we need not know more about the situation in order to proclaim victory over it, that we need not, understand all the angles, in order to know divine law, that we need not work with physical reason and cause but only with God, who is the only cause and action and effect within the universe. On another occasion, when mention was made of a loved one suffering from emotional upset, it again became very clear to me that, even though I knew little about helping others to demonstrate health, I must choose the small understanding I had by beginning with God, the eternal source of all stability, and where, I thought, is this stability but in the very place where confusion seems to exist, centering my thought on the loved one I affirmed for her that all was divine activity and peace, and that right where I was I could most easily, begin with God. As I learned later on, Within a few moments after that the young woman had noticed an inner warmth and activity stirring and loosening all tension and disturbance, permitting her to partake of nourishment and to continue immediately with her physical work. When the appearance of illness or pain presents itself, we can begin either with limited reason and logic and cause, or by turning our heart to God, the author of unlimited and perfect health. When someone is unkind or critical, we can begin either with resentment and self-pity, or by turning our heart to God, the author of love. When the appearance of lack tends to arouse ignominy, we can begin either with fault-finding and condemnation, or by turning our heart to God, the author of abundance. When emotions upset and frighten us we can begin either by running from the situation, or by turning our heart to God, the author of peace and power. What is your problem right now, beloved? How does the number of times you have thought of it, its appearance of cause and effect, compare with the number of times you have thought of God today? As soon as the weight of our thought about God overbalances our thought about negation, our good will become manifest. Greater understanding of a problem, no matter what the problem may be, will not serve to help us to understand God more readily, to work with God. Only by thinking of Him by returning to Him again and again in consciousness, shall we be able to work with Him. Still our impatient hearts may cry, but this habit of thinking of God is so slow in developing. I want to know the source of my good now, this is a natural protest, and it arises within each of us who wants to claim his heritage as God's son and heir. But the whole step cannot be taken in one immediate realization, for we have willfully travelled afar in consciousness from the Father's house, and divine awareness must be regained in diligence and patience. Suppose we wanted to renew a friendship with someone we knew years ago. Would we expect to know once more in one short moment at first meeting the entire nature of that person? Would we expect to regain that relationship without further visits with him, without devoting time and thought to him, to his ideas and interests? Of course not. Neither can we expect to regain awareness of the divine relationship between ourselves and our Heavenly Father except by living with Him in consciousness, by thinking of Him, of His nature, and of His fatherhood to us.
I know a very fine and brave person who, over a period of many years, has traveled constantly to visit dozens of persons and places in search of a healing of a seeming ailment. Each time a different solution is presented, and each time the solution fails, leading her to fix her attention on other symptoms and to start another search for a different kind of healing. She is not yet ready to begin with God, to accept the truth that God is the answer of perfect health and wholeness, the one answer to every question and doubt and difficulty. Her attitude toward the Heavenly Father is like that of the little girl who protested indignantly, I don't see what nature has to do with the out of doors. Again and again our blind personal will leads us away from the truth that we, began with God, that we are now and forever centered in God. While the truth of this divine relationship is beheld only dimly, the eternal bond between father and son is felt only occasionally. Beloved, do you too sometimes wonder what God, has to do with, your health and wholeness, supply and happiness? Believe this, he is your health and strength and sufficiency of every good thing. As God's children and as we are all basically and spiritually as inseparable from God our Father as nature is from the out of doors. Everything we think and feel and do should arise from a consciousness of our being forever centered in Him. Let us awaken to the Master's way of living, the way of radiantly joyous, successful living, by realizing that the only starting point in dealing with any circumstance, condition, or situation is God. No matter what we desire to demonstrate, if we will begin with God, good will result. Regardless of the appearance of any kind of ill health, the only starting point of all life is God, and all that emanates from God can be only good. Regardless of the appearance of any kind of lack, the starting point of all activity is God, and all that emanates from Him can be only abundance. Regardless of the appearance of any kind of frustration or emotional disturbance, the only starting point of all expression is God, and all that emanates from Him can produce and result in only joy and well-being and stability. Whatever your problem, beloved, begin with God, in your own way and your own words and your own prayers, the way that is simplest and easiest for you, and your heart's cry will be answered. Only begin with God. Even if you have tried many many times before this moment, try again to begin only with God, and you will behold Him in the midst of your problem. Every seeming difficulty or failure is an occasion for beginning with God. Every joy and success is an occasion for beginning with God. Every day is a day for beginning with God, every moment a moment for beginning with God. Every thought, every word, every act is an opportunity for beginning with God. When we allow all things to begin with God we shall see new beauty and truth, new wisdom and love, our world filled with radiance and glory, our self filled with the realization of our natural divinity and heritage of eternal joy. Meditation for Self-Help This is God's day. This is God's universe. The body I inhabit is God's holy temple. In Him I live and move and breathe and have my being. My Father and I are one. All the thoughts I think are God's thoughts. All the words I speak are God's words. All the deeds I do are God's deeds. I am here to express Him every day of this life and forever after. Every experience that comes to me is God's opportunity for more expression of Himself through me. I am required to do nothing, on my own, for it is His wisdom and understanding, His love and peace his joy and enthusiasm and inspiration that work through me to attain expression. I am God's radiant, progressive, successful child manifesting ever more and more of his glorious nature.